All right, hi everybody. Welcome to the final session of the UMDF 2022 meeting. Um, this is a summary of the talks that were presented this morning on mitochondrial disease and autism. And some of the speakers are here in the audience and have graciously agreed to answer questions if I can't answer them. So I was a member of the audience and took notes just like I did back in medical school and hopefully we'll deliver this okay. Um, I will say this was an exciting session for a lot of clinicians that were here because we get this question all the time. What is the relationship between autism and mitochondrial dysfunction? And then conversely, how many of our patients with mitochondrial disease have autism? And is this another symptom that we can treat in a different way? So, um, so Dr. Navio presented kind of a history of where we've been talking about autism and mitochondria. And so what we know is that when we look at the cohort of children with autism as a whole, 50 to 90% of those kids will have some demonstration of either altered metabolism or altered mitochondrial function. However, when we look at the group of children with primary mitochondrial disease, about 5% of them have autism as a symptom. And I actually think it might be a little bit um, underdiagnosed because a lot of the kids also have some neurodevelopmental disabilities. They may not meet full criteria for autism, but as a clinician who takes care of patients, I encourage the diagnosis of autism because we all know that helps buy more services. And I'd rather the diagnosis be there than not there if it's appropriate. Um, what I learned today is that when we talk about mitochondrial dysfunction in terms of autism spectrum disorders, that this is more about the dynamics of the mitochondria than actual mitochondrial damage, and that a lot of this has to do with how our body heals after injury. And so when we think about primary mitochondrial disease, again, the big problem is under-functioning, right? There's not enough generation of energy. Children are suffering because of the lack of ATP production. Um, but when we look at autism spectrum disorder, there's actually too much extra mitochondrial ATP, and there's a hypersensitivity going on in the cells because of that. So um, back in the year 2000, there was a publication that showed a patient with Lee syndrome and compared that to a patient that had regressive autism. And um, I think... Um, Dr. Navio, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that was a 3243 um, mtTRNA lysine um, mutation. And what was interesting there is that the phenotype definitely depended on the heteroplasmy level. And again, I'm just going to insert some personal points into this. When I see my cohort of the patients with 3243, I'm, again, very low numbers right now, but I'm starting to notice that the boys and the men have more autism, true autism-related symptoms, and the women with 3243 have more of the mood disorder, more anxiety and depression. Again, just a personal observation for right now. Um, and I do believe that it does depend on the heteroplasmy levels, because I think that the higher it gets, the more you're going to have um, a more severe and more typical primary mitochondrial disease presentation, either Lee or Milos. Um, the regression in, um, in both of these patient cohorts has been associated with infection in about 50%. And I think this has intrigued a lot of us over a long time. What is it about fever? What is it about infection that brings out these symptoms that causes this regression? Um, another interesting fact I learned today is that the greatest period of vulnerability isn't at the beginning of the infection, but rather five to ten days after the infection begins, because that's when the healing process is starting to occur, and, and you need those metabolic resources at that time. Um, and so then the question comes up, what are the, what's the role of the mitochondria in terms of the biology of healing, and what's going wrong if things don't heal properly? So there's a mouse model that's been developed to help answer this question and to evaluate what's called the CDR, or the cell danger response, and this has to do with purine metabolism. Um, in 2010, there was a mitochondrial autism conference here at a UMDF meeting, um, and what had co what's come out of that are many publications, but also really started Dr. Navio searching for what can I do to temporize what, what's going wrong in the cell. And so he started looking at sermon as a potential treatment, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit more. 
So again, there was growing evidence over the next decade in the literature um, that helped support this, this model of uh, defect in purine metabolism. And this was published by several groups, including an Italian cohort in 2016. Um, in 2019, there was a Hungarian publication that talked about decreased Purkinje cells of the cerebellum in mice um, and that they could intervene with an ATP in injection and that would bring out the same symptoms as autism in that model. And then they looked at suramin, which helps block some of that response to see if they can correct it and reverse some of those symptoms. So again, the models being laid out in either patient cohorts or through other scientific animal models. In 2020, there was a Depakote model. And so Depakote, um, as a child neurologist, we know that if you give a, a, a pregnant woman Depakote dur during that pregnancy, the fetus, this is a very known toxic medication to the developing fetus. It can cause spina bifida, it can cause autism. So there's a link there. But what they were able to do is give those patients suramin, uh, I'm sorry, those mice suramin, and it would correct the autism behaviors in the, in the mouse model. Um, and one of the things that I think is really interesting is to learn about how do we test hum what I call human behaviors in these animal models. And there's some really nice experiments um, that help that happen. So um, one of the experiments that we look at when we're looking at autism symptoms in mice is how well can they make friends with a new animal that's introduced into the cage. And that's how they measure these autistic features in the animal model. Um, and then in 2020, there was also a Fragile X model. So Fragile X is responsible for something like 5 to 10 percent of all autism. And so there is a fragile X model of autism. And these patients were also found to have an, uh, the model was also found to have a leak in ATP. Again, bringing it back to the mitochondria. So what we know about regressive autism is that there can be many triggers. And again, these have been explored um, pretty deeply because we want to see where the interventions can take place. So we know that there can be early life stressors. There are genetic factors, genetic predispositions to developing autism, environmental toxins, um, infections, and then inflammatory markers. And again, in, in terms of the cell danger response, we want to see how do the cells respond to these stressors. And in the mitochondrial lingo, we call these physiologic stressors. Right? And this is what we tell our patients about and um, why you might need to come to the emergency room if there's fever, infection, or some other kind of big stressor. So there is um, a, a cellular response that happens, and cells will release graded amounts of ATP in, in relationship and in response to stress. And the mitochondria, we know, sense everything that's happening in the cell. They sense the nutrients that are coming in and out. So they know if you're starving, if you're overeating, um, and they help change the body and ad adapt to environments and nutrition and the stress reactions of the cell. Um, so again, if there's an ATP leak, the question is how can we temporize that? How can we stop it and maybe help prevent some of that cellular damage? And this is where suramin comes in. Um, so again, getting back to the cell danger response, ATP, which is leaking during the cell danger response, it's necessary not only to make energy for the cells to run, but also it is a co-neurotransmitter. This is another thing I learned today. At every synapse, so in neurology, there's a synapse. Neurotransmitters have to be released and accepted at the next terminal, and ATP is a necessary step. So I could see um, if ATP is, is leaking, how that could cause a problem, and if there's an ATP deficit, how that also can cause a problem. And there is a lot of conditioning that happens on the postsynaptic side. Um, so what we know is that when you have a cell danger response, this is coordinated and it is a multi-system response that is initiated by an electron steal. So there's something happening at the level of the mitochondria there. So in terms of the healing, right, so we have the stressor, and then we have the body's response to that, and then we have the beginning of the healing cycle. And so this is also a reflexive, coordinated series of events that has to happen, and these are all metabolic pathways that um, it can either be triggered by stress or injury or infection. I'm sure we can add to that list surgery, anesthesia, all of our common triggers. Um, and again, this is coordinated also by the mitochondria. So. In order to talk about suramin and what's happening with ATP and, and trying to block the leakage, we have to talk about the purinergic receptor signaling. And so I remember when Dr. Navio first started talking about this more than 10 years ago and how exciting just the next set of experiments um, 
came to be. Um, but this, this has been known for a long time, these, the purinergic receptors, and these were discovered in 1972 by Dr. Jeffrey Bernstock, and there's three different families of purine receptors. Um, and what we know is that if you have high levels of this extra mitochondrial ATP, so the ATP that leaks out, this will inhibit oxidative phosphorylation, right? So it will inhibit your ability to, to uh, make further energy. And so instead of making more energy, what happens is we call this uncoupling or unlinking. So instead of oxygen coming in and getting ATP phosphorylated and making energy at the end, what happens is that gets uncoupled, the process of trying to do the electron transport chain to make energy, and instead you're just burning sugar and generating body heat. And that's not great if you need more energy for healing. Um, and what, what has also been discovered is this uncoupling process, this has now been linked to chronic pain syndromes. Um, so there's probably going to be a lot more to be explored in this arena. It also, when you were talking, made me think about all of the different um, neurotransmitter diseases that we know that are now being linked to chronic pain syndromes. So some of the channelopathies and things like that. So there's a lot happening in the neurons. All right, and then um, Dr. Navio mentioned some of Dr. Fry's research. So Dr. Richard Fry has been in the field for a very long time looking at mitochondrial disease and autism and um, some of the abstracts that came later in the morning um, went over some of his seahorse data from patients and animal models. Um, they've also done a lot of twin studies, um, and this started back when he was in Arkansas and is now in Phoenix at Barrow Institute. Um, and what he found is that um, ATP-linked respiration was the same, so making the same amount of energy as long as Oxfos was working. However, when he started looking at the twin that was typical and then the twin with regressive autism, the twin with regressive autism had more uncoupled ATP. So again, trying to put some causality to what we're seeing um, in, in the energetics. So. What, what about this extra mitochondrial ATP? What happens to this when people are going about their daily activities? And what's interesting is that even when you look at normal human exercise, that this extra mitochondrial ATP is released and it starts triggering the healing cycle. And you can measure this by looking at um, neurotransmitters in the spinal fluid, especially dopamine. And dopamine we always think about as the happy chemical. Um, in my case, I also think about it as like the, um, the, the chemical that's deficient in dystonia. Um, and so the, uh, the other thing um, that we know is that extra mitochondrial ATP drops your basal metabolic rate by 74% when we measure oxygen consumption. And so that, that was really, um, again, something that surprised me. I did not realize that all that extra mitochondrial ATP would affect the um, energetics this much. After an injection of ATP, the metabolic pathways start changing almost immediately. Within 30 minutes, we can measure that. And um, every animal model of autism spectrum disorder shows increased extra mitochondrial ATP. So it looks like a very good target for drugs if we can find a drug that will target it. And again, this is where Sermon came back in. So I forget how many thousands of drugs Dr. Navio went in search of, but this is a big topic in medicine, right? There are, there are new drugs that we could try to develop and discover, but there are a bunch of drugs that already exist that we can repurpose or borrow for another reason. And so Suramin, which is a drug for African sleeping sickness, um, can block the exit of ATP. And so this will then start competing with that extra mitochondrial ATP and help us restore some of that ATP that's needed and reduce the extra mitochondrial ATP, basically blocking the leak that's present. And so knowing this, um, he said, well, maybe we can put together a clinical trial. And he, had, uh, he started a phase one, two trial and had boys that were all brought in for giving this drug. They had a single dose of Suramin. They all had autism spectrum disorder, and this was all done at UCSD. Um, and then um, the, the SAT-1 trial involved 10 boys, and this was done between 2015 and 2016. And I think the children had a little bit of a, a spectrum of their autism, some of their abilities, but the ones that had the most impressive outcome were the few that were nonverbal and were actually speaking sentences within a few weeks of getting this drug, which was really phenomenal. I've seen those videos before, and it's always like what you really want to show parents that uh, you know want to have hope for this drug that could possibly 
really work. Um, so the fact that they, these children, you know, our teenagers have really not uttered any words since their regression in early toddlerhood, and then suddenly saying, I want a cheeseburger or I want a bag of chips, like, wow. Um, so the drug looked like it had a lot of nice potential, and again, we have all that science to back up why we think that that would work, and it's really um, a, a nice transition to seeing what happens at the bench and then trying to bring that to human trials. So this treatment decreased the core symptoms of autism in six weeks, and this was also measured not just by the parents anecdotally telling Dr. Navia what was happening at home, but also by measuring their ADOS scores and seeing an improvement in that compared to the children that received placebo. Um, and then separately, independently, another drug company called Pax Medica also conducted a randomized controlled trial using this drug in 2021. So I'm hoping that's not the last that we're going to hear about Suramin. Hopefully there will be bigger trial, phase three. Um, hopefully it's coming, right? Next year? Yes, COVID, yeah. All you need to do is say COVID, right? We, <laughs> COVID disrupted lots of clinical trials, but it's exciting if it comes back. That would be good. And I'm hoping a bigger cohort, which would be fabulous. So the conclusions, and I'm going to let Dr. Navio correct me for anything I said wrong or needs to be clarified. The core symptoms of autism spectrum disorder are caused by metabolic syndrome regulated by this ATP signaling, and that can inhibit the healing cycle. Again, the ATP, the, the ATP that's leaking out um, does not help that healing cycle at all and actually drops our metabolic rate. Um, the healing cycle and development don't progress normally in autism, even when you remove the pathogenic triggers. So that trigger is long gone, right? The fever, the infection, that's long gone. And what's happened is that cascade of what um, occurred in the cell after all that um, stress is still happening. Um, healing is an active, energetic process, and it's very resource consuming. And this is blocked by that extra mitochondrial ATP. So again, we really need to try to stop that leak. And antiperinergic therapies such as sermon can block the ATP exit and reduce the effect of extra mitochondrial ATP. So very exciting talk. Yeah, I think this is a great question. So I'll repeat the question just in case everybody didn't hear it. So the question is, you know, what, why am I using the terminology regressive autism? Um, and I'm not an expert in autism, I will say that, but I've seen plenty of kids that have autism. Um, so my understanding is that there are for me, I divide it into two. There are children that really did not have normal development from the get-go. Right, and they develop these autistic symptoms, but they really never had a regression. It might just be very slow but steady development, and then you know they have autism by a certain age because they're fulfilling criteria. There is another set of children that start developing very neurotypically, and they achieve milestones. They're walking, they're talking, and then something happens, right? And usually, when I've heard parents tell me this story, it's usually a very dramatic event. One day they're talking, the next day, there's a vacant look in their eyes and the kid's not speaking anymore. That's regressive autism. So when we say regression, it's like you had skills and they are now gone. And what's interesting, again, just to kind of bring that to the world of mitochondrial disease, this is what we worry about in Lee syndrome and other mitochondrial disorders, right? Kids are doing what they're doing and they may have certain symptoms and then they get some type of stressor trigger and there's a regression, right? And in the mitochondrial world, you can sometimes see that demonstrated by brain lesions, right? There might be some acute Lee syndrome lesions in the brain that go along with that. Um, so it's interesting because there's some very similar things that are happening as far as the trigger and then the response, right? And what's really interesting is that this regressive model of autism seems to be very much linked to mitochondrial dysfunction and ATP. Um, the changes in ATP. Um, so there's definitely, um, you know, these are not the same disease, right, but there's a lot of overlap. And in some cases, um, I, I could see a child with Lee syndrome and have it look like a regressive autism story until I go to get that MRI. And then, you know, because the kids with autism really don't have the brain lesions to go with, with that, unless, unless they have a primary mitochondrial disorder. Uh, and I think it's been long suspected that children with regressive autism have more mitochondrial um, influence in terms of their um, picture than children that never had those skills to begin with. And they just have more like a developmental delay story. Okay, then we have Dr. Pat Levitt, who is also sitting in the audience right now. I apologize for anything you're about to hear. If I 
uh, say it wrong. So, but this was also a really interesting talk about early life stress and brain mitochondrial dysfunction. And so he talked about adverse childhood experiences, what we call ACEs, and then this whole concept of allostasis, which I really just love. This was the first time I heard about this um, as an adaptive response to chronic stress and physiologic consequences. Don't worry, I'm going to tell you what allostasis is. Um, and then um, there's a model of early adversity and molecular adaptations with a focus on the mitochondrial function of how those, the adaptation happens. And um, he also then talked about translational studies for early identification of who is at risk. So I don't have a good picture of this because I didn't take screenshots at the time, but I think what I want to do before I, I tell you more about this slide is just what is allostasis? So this was my interpretation of this. And I'm going to use blood pressure as my model just because I think for me this is an easier way for me to think about it. But when I have patients with, let's say, dysautonomia or um, like fluctuations in blood pressure, heart rate, usually there's like this homeostasis, right? It's a little high, it's a little low, but we're usually kind of like going right along this like normal curve, little high, little low, but we return to normal. And that's homeostasis. And allostasis is when you have that type of pattern, but something suddenly makes it take it to the next level, and now you're kind of vacillating along the new normal, either higher than where you were or lower than where you were. Um, hopefully I didn't misinterpret what you were teaching this morning. Okay. So what does that have to do with all of the rest of the talk? So we talked about adverse childhood experiences and, and this concept of tipping the scales, right? So how much is too much push where you can't return back to your homeostasis, you can't return back to normal? And there was a lot, uh, there were a lot of really fun videos during this talk um, about what happens in early childhood and, and then so, and sometimes those same things could um, happen again in adolescence, but it's much more important as what, what happens to you in early childhood as far as these adverse um, experiences. And these can be some type of trauma, right, whether you're in an accident, a long hospitalization, things like that. And, um, and before they even said it um, on the slides, I was thinking, oh, we're talking about resiliency, right, like how do people bounce back? And another interesting road for me, just in terms of thinking about mitochondrial disease, is when we talk about how can we help children with mitochondrial disease we talk about resiliency, right? What's it gonna take for them to be able to bounce back from that illness or that, uh, that stressor? Um, and so then we started talking about our, our genes, just our whole genomic makeup, and that our genes are designed to respond to the environment. I was glad that you brought that up because it always reminds me of Doug Wallace's talks about our mitochondrial DNA and how they're so adaptive, right? And when I'm, I'm trying to talk to people about changes in our mitochondrial DNA and those changes don't mean disease-causing mutations, it's that your ancestors had to learn how to live in the mountains in Nepal, right? And so, you know, we, we had to adapt to be able to learn to live at these different climates. I talked already about uncoupling that Dr. Navio brought up in his talk about generating body heat our mitochondrial DNA had to learn to uncouple or we would have never been able to get off the equator as a human race, right? We had to learn how to um, uncouple our mitochondrial DNA from oxfos and, and be able to generate that body heat. So a lot of the changes in our genes are adaptive. Our bodies know what we're doing and where we're living. Usually it takes years and years and years for those kind of things to happen, but that's what our genes are doing. Okay, so now we go back to how can we measure these adverse childhood experiences? And there's a behavioral risk factor surveillance system, and this was done a number of years ago, looking at the prevalence of adverse childhood experiences. And 62% of kids that were surveyed um, at this time had at least one adverse childhood experience. 25% had three or more. And then, of course, you can start looking at the subpopulations. And as you could imagine, no surprise, this could be affected and influenced by your socio economic status, your ethnic background, but interestingly, those kids that develop some type of neurodevelopmental disability had increased risk of have ha having had one of these adverse childhood experiences. And then the, the next interesting thing was that if you look individually, you couldn't really match up like, oh, this happened to Johnny at age three and now look at him, but like when you look at this back as a full population, the score of how many adverse childhood experiences you have would predict poor health. 
when you look at this, in, uh, again, as a population. So this matters, right? This matters to long-term mental and physical well-being if you have an early adverse childhood experience. The other thing that I didn't have a chance to ask you, and this is going to be very controversial in a way, because I don't like to experiment on vulnerable kids, but all of these children that are, that are witnessing these horrifying shootings at schools and like, what, this is an unbelievable question and population to study because I can't even imagine what's going to happen to these children that survive the school shootings, right? Um, and I'm sure there's a lot of psychologists that are like being very thoughtful about how are we going to get data on, on, on these kids so that we can learn from what this does to them over their lifetime. All right, so early life stress, we want to think about those clinical outcomes. Um, and again, from my perspective, I think about the kids that are hospitalized, right? The kids that come in and they won't get back in an MRI scanner because they have PTSD, right? So just being sick early on and having prolonged hospitalizations and people coming into the room, for me, this is early life stress, right? Um, so exposure to adverse childhood events increases your risk for poor physical and mental health. Um, this can emerge at different stages throughout your life, so it doesn't necessarily show up right there, right after the stressor. It can show up later. Um, he talked a lot about Dr. Bruce McEwen, who studied the stress, and again, the allostasis, how um, these stressors can cause a shift in your regular homeostatic mechanisms, um, and that some of the psychosocial stress do affect your mitochondria. So again, allostasis um, it was also defined as a chemophysiologic wear and tear, the fluctuations that can happen. And this can be changed to abnormal ranges um, of tolerability or maladaptive. So again, I can imagine that if you're supposed to be riding this line, let's just pick heart rate just because it's easy, and you're supposed to fluctuate here and something happens, and all of a sudden, this is your new normal, and then something happens and this is your new normal, now you have somebody with maybe POTS syndrome, right? And you have you know, uh, tachycardia syndrome, because your heart rate has gone so high and now that's your new normal where you're fluctuating. Then he talked about one of my favorite people, T Dr. Tally Barham, who I've had the pleasure of hearing lecture at Child Neurology Society meetings, and she has done so much work on maternal stress, um, and I love all of her experiments. I think it's fabulous. But um, this, so Dr. Barham um, studies a lot of mouse models, and she has this famous experiment where she has one mouse in one cage, another mouse in another cage. These are pregnant females. She gives one mouse all the lovely bedding materials and the other mouse, like, old newspaper. And they're supposed to, like, they're nesting, right? They're trying to get ready for having their babies. And the mom who wasn't given enough bedding material has really unpredictable behavior and I think really doesn't attach well to the babies once she has her pups. And so just having that maternal stress um, can affect the children. That always hurts me as a working mother, just saying. But I think she's done experiments that prove that it's, it's the quality, not the quantity of time that you spend with your babies that matters, and I thanked her for that too. <laughs> Um, okay, so then um, we went on to talk about early molecular adaptations of early life stress. And he talked about proteins, especially in the hippocampus. And the hippocampus is a center for memory. Um, it's, it also is a center for stress. And it, what's really interesting is just looking at what, when you have early life stress and we look at the hippocampus in the brain, what proteins change because of that stress? What goes up, what goes down? And he was able to look at four groups dividing male and female, and then who had early life stress and who did not have an early life stressor. And what was interesting is that females had an enrichment of mitochondrial proteins, and there were three proteins in complex one especially. And this made me think about Elhan and whether we can explain some sex differences that we see in Elhan based on some of these theories. Because Elhan, the labor hereditary optic neuropathy, the blindness is usually triggered by a stressful event like either alcohol or smoking, and then I see this like female to male, like th this for me meant there might be some protective mechanism happening here, and I was like, Psh, I have to go find Dr. Sadoon and ask him about this unless Dr. Navio already knows the answer to this. But um, this was just fascinating to me how, again, maybe this is a, a question that we've long had about Elhan. Um, so interestingly, these changes are not sustained in adulthood. And complex one activities is actually decreased in the adult hippocampus following this early life stress event. Um, and then the stress response, the allostasis, again, increases, but later life adaptive outcomes show decreased allostasis. So again, I, I think that what we're seeing is that you can have an early life stressor, there's a period of this vulnerability where things 
change and protein expression can change, but then it's not long lasting and things return back to where they were supposed to be. Um, but just again, really fascinating information about early life stress responses. Um, okay, and then going back to the mitochondrial component of this for me, what about oxidative stress, right? And so um, for the for people in the audience who have not thought about oxidative stress a lot, or um, if you haven't heard a lot of those talks um, here at the meeting, um, it, for, for me, for the way that I describe oxidative stress is that when you have a mitochondrial disease, there's two problems. One is that you're not making enough energy. And then if we think about electron transport chain and trying to make energy as little factories, you know, when I am on the highway and I see an old factory, there's black smoke blowing into the air, hurting the environment, right? It's a pollution. This is what happens in our mitochondria. Something's wrong. We're not making enough ATP. And because those factories are broken, there's oxygen-free radicals destroying the cell membranes. And so this is really bad. And oxidative stress in some mitochondrial diseases is more problematic than actually the lack of ATP. All right, because that's what's really doing the damage. And so one of the ways we measure oxidative stress in, in blood, we can measure in urine, is osoprostenines. Um, and that is a marker for increased oxidative stress. And what we have seen in children going back to children with autism is that they also have these markers of increased oxidative stress. And um, when you have a higher risk score, so we know which children are at higher risk for autism, they have higher reactive oxygen as well. And, um, and you can compare mothers to babies um, and see who has increased oxidative stress. And I think what you were saying is that the mothers who have increased ROS, their children also have increased ROS, and those children are then more at risk to develop autism later on. So um, there is now a first family study at UCLA, and this is a prospective study to look at this even more, and this is based on some cheek swabs. And you can look at, um, I had a question for you about this, mitochondrial DNA copy number and cell-free circulating double-stranded mitochondrial um, RNA. And so we can start looking at these changes in mitochondrial DNA, mitochondrial RNA. Um, this was really interesting because I think that um, when we clinically right now send mitochondrial DNA copy number looking for depletion of mitochondrial DNA, we can look at it in muscle, we can look at it in liver, but people are still trying to perfect doing it in something like fibroblast or cheek swabs. So I wanted to find out who's doing that for you because this would be a nice tool for us to have for primary mitochondrial disease. Um, I, is somebody at UCLA doing that work? That's CHLA, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, 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 sorry. I had some little dyslexia happening there. Okay, so this is at CHLA. Thank you. All right, so um, then we talked about um, using, instead of a single strain of mouse that is commonly used in research, to develop different strains of mice because just like humans, we, we can't just have um, an experiment in mice that only looks at one strain. We wanted to try to capture through the animal models the diversity of the human population and the full spectrum of what we can see in terms of symptoms. And so that's being developed for future studies and for drug development. And I thought, of course, that's a good idea too. Okay, Dr. Levitt, anything that I really botched that you want to help me correct? Other than UCLA? Okay. <laughs> All right, and that study is going to be recruiting and is ongoing, right? Excellent. Okay. Um, then we had Dr. Rebecca Grudzinski um, tuning in um, over Zoom, and this was great. So this also got me thinking a lot about very early pre-symptomatic intervention in autism spectrum disorder. And I don't think I've thought about this, and a, and a few speakers really touched on this. Um, the, the common pathway right now is we have a child that's born, you watch them develop, all of a sudden they're not developing their milestones, somebody starts being worried about autism, then they meet autism criteria, they get the diagnosis, and then we start intervention. And this is like a whole model flip. Like, what if we know who's at risk and we start intervening then, 
we don't wait for symptoms to appear. How amazing would this be? Not just for kids with autism, but frankly, the kids with mitochondrial disease also, right? So I took a lot from these talks. Um, so she talked a lot here, and she's at UNC, um, and we, she talked a lot about the infant brain imaging study, or IBIS, and um, how they're using early behavior and neuroimaging combined to predict diagnostic and adaptive outcomes into adolescence. Um, they're doing a replication study, so they bring new infants into the study between 6 and 36 months of age, not just following them from birth. And then they're trying to predict the, predict the trajectory of symptom development and then develop interventions, and again, especially pre-symptomatically if we can see who's at risk from these early, early studies. Um, so one thing that I think has been long known is that if there's a family history of autism, the next baby is more likely to have autism than a family without autism, right? And I think this goes to how we know gen um, autism is mainly a genetic uh, problem, genetic predisposition. So um, if there is an older sibling with autism, the next baby is somebody who's a really good candidate for a study like this, so we can see if that next baby does have pre-symptomatic risk factors or, or any type of signs and symptoms that we can detect before the symptoms are apparent. Um, and again, normally, the track is um, symptoms will develop gradually and usually by the third birthday, um, but usually the earliest symptoms are there at 12 months of age and they need intervention by 24 months of age. So we don't want to wait until somebody's three and first trying to get into preschool to know this. Um, and again, some might need even earlier intervention and some might have a later onset of symptoms and this just gets back to this is a huge uh, spectrum of what we're going to see. And so we want to develop e tests and interventions for each permutation of, of this condition. Um, so many, many of these kids are going to have a pre-symptomatic period. And this gets back, Stacey, to your question. Like, some kids actually are developing typically. There is no time that you're worried about. They, they actually are pre-symptomatic. They have no symptoms until that event happens where suddenly the symptoms show up for regressive autism. So many of the kids will be pre-symptomatic. And, and that just means in this context that the symptoms are not explicit. You wouldn't look at that child and say, oh, I wonder if they have autism. But you might see behaviorally they could be identical to other infants or they could have some mild features like maybe that baby's not making good eye contact and you're just not sure is this just delayed visual maturation or are we going to have a socialization problem um, so the but the early manifestations don't meet criteria yet so those are kind of like the pre-symptomatic kids um, and so what they wanted to do was look at biomarkers, more biomarkers at this point, to determine who's at risk for developing autism um, spectrum disorder. Um, so they could look at brain markers at 6 to 12 months. And one of the things that helped predict this with 81% of a positive predictive value is surface area of the brain. And I found this really intriguing. And also 77% accuracy of, ri of predicting risk when you looked at a prenatal ultrasound based on the head size. And when I thought about these statistics, this brought me back to just thinking about the genetics of autism because I think that um, the American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics has some specific guidelines for who should get a genetic workup. And the kids who have autism, when we look at like doing a microarray in Fragile X, the yield is like 10 to 15 percent. You might find something on those genetic tests. And then if you add exome to that, depending on your population, it can get as high as 44%. And this is statistics I'm quoting from a JAMA article that was done by some Canadian autism doctors probably 10 years ago by now, when Exome was kind of first on the block. But one of the things that they help distinguish and would help you get to a higher yield with genetic testing is head size. If the kids had macro or microcephaly, the yield of getting a positive genetic test was that much bigger, because then it's more of like a syndromic autism and not just autism alone. So I'm really intrigued by um, just differences in head size are leading us to um, know that as a biomarker. Um, it also makes me think about diseases where we know that there's just um, a problem with neuronal um, circuitry, like Rett syndrome, where there's almost like too many connections and they don't get pruned properly, right? So it makes you have a larger head size. Um, okay, so um, moving on to um, filling in the, the whole package here, early biomarkers predicting later onset autism spectrum. If you have a sibling with autism, plus or minus early onset concerns, that gave you a higher likelihood 
of having autism, right? So the kids that had early on, you, obviously the more things, the more risk factors you have, the higher probability it's going to be. So fit positive family history and early onset concerns, those kids were in the highest, the higher likelihood. And then if you had an additional marker after that, so either your MRI or prenatal ultrasound showed this bigger brain volume or larger surface area, that moved you into the very high likelihood of developing autism. And again, I started this, right? This is our opportunity to develop some pre-symptomatic interventions. However, um, what are we targeting? So let's say you start early intervention on a kid who has normal development. How are you going to know that what your, you know, your intervention is doing anything? By lack of regression later on, I'm sure, right? But you don't really know, even though there's a nice high positive predictive value here, you don't really know that that kid's definitely going to go on and have autism. And so um, I think early intervention for autism is a good thing. I don't see that as highly invasive. But there are some bioethical people that might argue like you're over-medicalizing a child that's completely healthy and typical and normal and we have to just, you know, and then there's limited resources. So it would be great to really kind of start boiling this down to who, you know, can we know for sure who needs that early intervention. Um, and we talked a lot about having a non-deterministic uh, perspective on this. Um, and um, again, that autism symptoms, there is a predisposition, a genetic predisposition. Sometimes we know what that gene is, sometimes we don't. And then of course, like this kind of two-hit hypothesis, then you have a genetic predisposition and then something in the environment, something that is that stressor that kind of brings those symptoms out. So the current state of research, um, right now there are children that got um, early intervention um, po after their diagnosis, and this is a category of kids that are in that two to five year old range, and there's mixed results, right? So if we look at those kids that have gotten early intervention after their diagnosis, 20 to 50% of them show improvement, and again, there's high feasibility. We're able to deliver things like ABA therapy and, and TSS wraparound and these things, and it's, and it's very acceptable. Um, treatment um, intervention. Um, and then we have the cohort of kids that have pre-symptomatic interventions, and these kids are less than 18 months of age. And again, these are mostly siblings, right? So we knew they had that higher risk factor with a positive family history. And 20 to 30% of them go on to receive an autism diagnosis later. And so far, they're still low numbers, but um, I look at this, I kind of want to say it in reverse. So if we know that there's a high likelihood of them developing autism and they get early intervention before any symptoms and only 20 to 30 percent of them go on to, to have a, a diagnosis of autism. That means that 70 to 80 percent of them don't have autism later. That looks pretty good. I like flipping those numbers because for me that's like really, that, that, that seems very successful. Um, okay, so and then the, we know that the early intervention needs to be combined skill oriented but with structured teaching, like hand over hand and that kind of thing, and dyadic relation, relational intervention, so more of a responsiveness and teaching social cues and things like that. Um, and I think that, um, like all things in medicine, we want to make sure that we're picking the right outcome measures to measure how well did our intervention work. And so for autism, that's going to include um, your social communication abilities, sensory regulation things, so like some of the sensory processing um, regulation problems that happen in autism, motor skills, and attention ability. And the, these targets are all empirically supported um, just by knowing what the symptoms of autism are, and we have good tools to measure these outcomes. In terms of considering the design for early intervention, she talked about um, doing ongoing assessments, ongoing monitoring. What's the role of the caregiver? And can we um, make sure that the family knows what to do by um, making sure that the family's trained to do some of these interventions and has um, ways of doing some adaptive functioning um, and having the caregivers as, um, as the intervention. And I've personally, I know families that needed to have some extra either family counseling or just really um, coming to terms with how do you deal with behavior. This is a kid that won't do time out, right? So they need to come up with some of these adaptive strategies. And then, of course, what's meaningful to the families, right? Like I know families that their greatest wish is that they could just all go out to dinner together. And they can't because the behavior is just too difficult to control. And so that would be a really meaningful outcome, like being able to have some type of behavior intervention that improves the, the family's quality of life.
I did steal a picture here just because I like this cartoon. Now, I was sitting over there, and I really apologize. A lot of my pictures, they're, they're the quality that you're going to see here. But this was just really nice. Again, just showing there are so many different potential etiologies, and there's probably a combo pack of many of them. So we have sex hormones, right? We know boys outnumber girls um, by, I don't even know what the current statistics are, four to one. Thank you. Um, so there's a sex hormone influence. There's some skewed cytokine pro-inflammatory markers, which I love anything dealing with pro-inflammation, so we're going to talk about that. The anti-brain antibodies, I'm going to talk about that in the upcoming talks. The role of infection as a trigger and a stressor. Um, the gut microbiome, I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. Again, the genetic predispositions. There are genes that when they're mutated, they cause autism. And again, the yield is probably not even 50% right now. Um, and so we're still learning what genes cause autism, right? We're, we're learning all the genes. And then, of course, the environmental insults that can happen. And then we have, I think, a baby in a womb, right? And so then there's all those maternal factors that go into this as well. Okay, Dr. Judy Vandewater um, talked about neuroimmunology and autoimmunity in autism spectrum disorders. And again, this is something that um, I think we're all very excited about. Um, I I probably talked to Dr. Navio about this 10 years ago, right? Like what is behind this fever and infection as a trigger for regression? We need to figure this out. We have to be able to stop this cascade. And again, just flipping the switch for a second over to mitochondrial disease, we still don't know what all the lesions are that we see in the brain, right? And I think a lot of people are starting to wonder how much inflammatory role is there. And Doug Wallace is studying this like crazy right now. Um, what's, what's the role of neuroinflammation? in some of our primary mitochondrial diseases. So when we think about this category, neuroimmunology and autoimmunity, some of the potential etiologies I just showed you on the cartoon on that last slide. Um, and we started talking about gestational immune dysregulation and how that evolves into subsets of autism spectrum disorder. So um, interestingly, when we think about moms that when they're pregnant, they have an infection, and it happens all the time, right? Everyone gets exposed to things when they're pregnant. Um, this becomes a risk factor because infection will cause a fever in many cases, and then there's some impaired immune regulation, and then there's an increase in all of the chemicals that talk to each other in the immune system. And so your T cells and your B cells send out these signals, and we call those cytokines, right? These are interleukins. These are all kinds of chemicals that help with the whole inflammatory cascade. Again. It's really good when they're there to do some healing, but there's some bad things that can happen to this cascade as well, especially if it's not normal. Um, so then we started talking about early markers for autism, um, and, and again, looking at this specific category of inflammatory markers. What are the risk factors for autism when we look at this? So um, they were able to take bank samples, so women that were pregnant that were just getting their normal triple screen or what have you during pregnancy between 15 and 19 weeks, they had all those samples stored. They were able to pull them and compare those samples um, to these boxes. So some, so these are women when they're pregnant have blood. We put that away. We see what happens to their babies. And it's broken down into these categories. Some of the kids had autism spectrum but without intellectual disability. Some of the kids had autism with intellectual disability. Some of the kids had developmental delay but without autism, just some other nonspecific neurodevelopmental disability. And then what I call gen pop, right? Like so the kids that were neurotypical. So we had four categories. And when they looked and compared what's the inflammatory profile of all these bank samples, the kids that ended up having autism and intellectual disability, those moms had a higher amount of pro-inflammatory cytokines on that bank sample. So this is a signature of something, right? And we need to pay attention to this. Why is it there? What does this mean? Um, and then another category is that some moms also develop autoantibodies. And this is called maternal autoantibody reactivity. So again, on the one hand, we have inflammatory markers. And on the other hand, we have the mother developing autoantibodies. And so uh, this, this has um, overtones of autoimmune disease, right? So like the, basically the body making the antibody that attacks part of your body, and it's not supposed to be happening that way, right? And there's a whole bunch of autoimmune diseases that work this way, and they're pretty bad, right? So like Sjogren's and lupus and like this whole category. So making an antibody that's then going to go attack your baby's brain is not a good thing, right? And so this is a good thing for us to realize this is happening because maybe we can stop it. 
and so um, the women that had um, autoantibodies, there was some correlation to their baby's ADOS scores later on. So then we wanted to, again, bring this back to more basic science and look at an animal model for this maternal autoantibody syndrome and the reactivity. And so they looked at mice, and then they looked at rats. And I, and I loved when you said this, that the rats actually, they have a better frontal cortex. We can mimic human behavior, study human behavior a little bit better, and they have bigger heads, so we probably can get a better MRI. Um, for those rodents. Um, so we looked at the mice and the rats that had autoantibody development. And then you can look at the offspring of these rodents and what happened. Um, there was decreased soci sociability in the, in the juvenile rats um, from the moms that had the increased antibody. And we could measure this because it, compared to the normal rat that's running around the cage and playing and doing things, this rat would sit in the corner and do self-grooming. So very, so more antisocial, repetitive, um, so, so some of those repetitive behaviors. And again, mimicking human disease, right? Um, there was rat behavior, um, more rat behavior with multiple antibodies, and I have some of those listed there. And again, the controls were very playful, um, but it was interesting that it was kind of like not just one antibody, but kind of a panel of antibodies. Um, the rat, again, that had the, um, that was born to the mom with increased autoantibodies had reduced play, de decreased communication when they were measuring their vocalizations. Um, and then this kind of was really sad, right? The control rat would like see that that other rat wasn't normal, normal behavior, wouldn't get social cues, would actually start ignoring that other rat, right? So it changed the behavior of even the control rat because then there was like very decreased um, social ability between the two and that this gap worsened the older that the rats got. Um, in terms of the MRI, this was again also fascinating. There were changes in size and development, and the males had more issues in their sensory cortex and their cerebellum, and the females had more differences in their midbrain, and these were volumetric, measurable differences in brain volumes. And then the MR spectroscopy, which is a tool we use in mitochondrial disease to look for lactate and other brain markers, this showed decreased glutathione, which is a measure of oxidative stress in the brain, right? You're using up all your glutathione. Um, they actually used this as an outcome measure in a Lee syndrome trial using epi743 as a drug years ago, right, measuring that decreased glutathione in the brain. So we know this is a good biomarker for primary mito as well. There was also decreased glutamine and increased taurine. And increased tar when the, the taurine is increased, this um, interferes with lactic dehydrogenase and the inability to convert pyruvate back to lactate. So there's some metabolic consequences to having these increased autoantibodies. Okay, so the conclusions were that these, these autoantibodies and the, um, the, the increased inflammatory profile can contribute to altered neurodevelopment, and there, this could be the mechanism be behind what's happening with infection, right? So if a mother has infection, um, those autoantibodies might try be responding to a virus or a bacteria and accidentally cross-react with areas of the brain. Um, and might also trigger this increased in inflammatory cytokine profile. Um, and again, it, we're still working it out, is that what's really causing the autism or this like true, true unrelated? But it looks pretty clear that there's, um, there's some correlations here. Um, there, the in vitro studies demonstrate effects of the inflammatory cytokines on neuronal health and development. The antibodies localize to the brain of the developing animal. Some of the brains are enlarged when the mom had the maternal antibody um, reactivity. And the mouse and the rat models capture the symptoms of autism spectrum disorder pretty well. So it's a good animal model to study. Okay. Um, then we had a talk by Dr. Brittany Needham. Um, and this was multi-omic features of the microbiome and autism, so looking at the gut bacteria. And this is a really hot topic for lots of areas of medicine right now. Um, and so she talked about the enzymatic diversity of the, of the gut mi microbiota, and this results in a lot of metabolic byproducts. And I think one thing that I don't think about a lot is that when we eat protein, right, so I just had a turkey sandwich, the bacteria in my gut are going to work on that and taking the breakdown of those amino acids and turning them into things that I need like neurotransmitters. And it's just kind of crazy to think about the bacteria helping us in that way. 
So it's probably important what the quality of those bacteria are. Um, and, and we know that some of these byproducts will interface with the external environment. And a lot of these are signaling molecules. Again, a lot of these are really important. Um, so again, the amino acids are broken down by our gut bacteria into neurotransmitters, phenols, whatever other proteins we might need. Um, so there's the substrate, again, my turkey sandwich. It gets transformed by the gut bacteria. There's an output. And the question is, if we can figure out how the gut microbiome might need to change and change the amount of proteins it's transforming, we might be able to use these as a therapeutic target. So this is exciting work. And I would say, I, I don't know anybody who's not studying the microbiome right now. You could name a disease, cancer they're looking at. They're looking at it for everything right now. Um, so there are, in fact, many nor neuropsychiatric conditions that are associated with shifts in the microbiome. And she talked about Parkinson's and Huntington's and Alzheimer's. And of course, we then started talking about um, autism spectrum disorder. And you can manipulate the gut microbiome of mouse models and see what happens. And in terms of um, the symptoms of autism spectrum disorder, they really like looking at things like anxiety and mood and things like that. So um, after looking at and analyzing lots of samples, they found a specific metabolite that could be a really good signature for autism. And this is called 4-ethylphenyl sulfate or 4-EPS. And they found this by looking at 231 plasma samples paired with 37 fecal samples, right? So you have to have a patient bring in poop and draw their blood at the same time and look at those together. And then they did what's called untargeted metabolomics, right? Like, can we just look at everything, put it through and see if we get a signal? And again, four EPS is the signal that came out on this testing. And this showed the highest fold change between people that were neurotypical and people that had autism. Um, so it looks like this is a pretty interesting signature. And because they were able to also detect it in the fecal matter, we know that the microbiome uh, may be important for this. So then they studied the pathway of how do you make 4-EPS, and this, this is um, involving an amino acid called tyrosine, and they were able to use the mouse model to test the causation, right? And what they found is that there were no differences in the gut between neurotypical mice and the mice that had autism. So then they were able to go look at the mouse brains. And using some functional ultrasound techniques, they were able to see that the, the mice that had 4EP plus had increased functional connectivity, increased activity in the limbic system, which is kind of like the emotional housing of the brain, and that the, the rats, uh, I'm sorry, the mice with increased 4EPS, or when they exposed the mice to 4EPS, this led to behavior changes on the maze in an open field and marble bury, burying. So more fear and anxiety. And again, it's just fascinating to kind of hear how the mouse experiments um, transfer over to human behavior. So for example, the open field is you have a box and there's a red there's a red square in the center and the mice that are more fearful kind of stay in the corners or go along the edges. And the mice that have less fear and less anxiety are free range and they're in that central square a lot more than the mice that have um, the fear and anxiety. Um, and then she started talking about the oligodendrocytes of the brain, and this also got really interesting. So these are the cells in the brain that generate myelin for the brain. And myelin is like the insulation for your brain. It's so that your connections go much, much faster, just like you're insulating a wire. Um, and it turns out that how well you produce myelin can be affected by your gut microbiome, and that myelin is very dynamic. It's not just one and done. You lay down that insulation and you walk away, but it's constantly changing, and it really has an impact on brain function and behavior. And so there's now a new phase one study using a drug that will decrease this 4-EPS, again, the high signature in autism, and will correlate to improved behavior, so decreasing the anxiety. So this is great. Because again, if I think about a child that I know with autism and has a lot of anxiety, these are the kids that go into the clinic room, I can't close the door or the kid will start screaming, right? Um, and, and so if something like this works, this could again have a huge impact on, on um, the kids with autism. Um, I did take a couple pictures here, but I think I actually captured all of this. So the key findings were identifying the metabolomic profile, um, the 4-EPS pathway, 
how the, how the gut microbiome influences the brain, influences the oligodendrocytes, and that there's an oral absorbent drug that can remove 4-EPS to help, hopefully help target that uh, symptom. Okay. I'm going to take a quick sip. Um, Next, we talked about EEG, and I am a child neurologist, but I really think about using EEG to look at seizures, um, and um, how are we doing on time? We have 15 minutes? I'll, I'll, I, I think we're, I, hopefully we're kind of getting towards the end. Um, so this was looking at EEG and just differences in EEG, not, not seizing EEG, but just the um, patterns of EEG. And again, looking at EEG to see, can we determine who has presymptomatic autism? And again, that whole current model, we wait for the symptoms, then we do intervention, can we do the reverse? And can we detect this early on in EEG? So they looked at two cohorts of kids, those that had a high likelihood versus those that had a low likelihood, and they looked at EEG at three, six, nine, and 12 months, and MRI of the brain at nine months, and then ADOS at 18 months and 36 months. And they found three different cohorts, those that developed autism, those that had atypical development, but not clearly autism, but not clearly typical, and then those that had typical development. Um, and these slides were great, and I actually, I probably don't have time to even try to address some of the um, things that she was trying to point out, but you can see she was talking about the differences in some of the peaks on EEG, and um, again, just intervening along this timeline. Um, so in terms of her conclusions, again, precise measures, biomarkers that help us look at the presymptomatic population. Earlier might not necessarily be better. However, again, I like this whole idea that we're intervening as soon as we can. We all need bigger sample sizes to really prove. When we have low numbers, we want bigger numbers to prove um, efficacy of anything that we do. And then can we try to leverage individual differences in, in developmental timing? So these conclusions were really powerful. I'll say a, a one-liner about each abstract. The first abstract was a mitochondrial model um, of using um, a, a mitochondrial DNA change that might be linked to Ehlers-Danlos syndrome in a, in a large family. And that came from Dr. Patrick Schaefer um, in Doug Wallace's lab. Um, Allison Lane gave a beautiful presentation looking at mitochondrial respiration in autism spectrum disorder in um, cells and found that those that have autism have higher reactive oxygen species and, re and reduced reserve capacity, again, going after that oxidative stress. And then Brianna Werner gave a beautiful talk on mitochondrial respiration alterations in epileptic foci from fresh human brains, so kids that were having craniotomy surgeries to remove abnormal epilepsy brain tissue, and then looking at those differences in brain and looking at different signatures. And next, they will look at an autism population. Um, and again, I had a couple of her pictures. And I just, okay. So um, in terms of like the bottom line, I think what we all had, what the panel came to the cl conclusion of is early intervention um, for autism is one of the most important things we can do. But again, can we start answering the questions of who's at risk, how do we measure that, and how do we do the interventions? And then um, again, just looking at who will be included, what do we call a normal control for comparison, and just pointing out like some of the differences in doing some behavioral health interventions and studies compared to um, more traditional RCTs for medical uh, monitoring. Um, so everyone was very inspired to continue to do ongoing studies, looking at moms throughout pregnancy to really determine can we prevent things even at that level, and then continuing to look at twin studies, which is really important. And I think that wraps up all of the slides. Um, so thank you very much. That was a whirlwind.